Uh, so I, I'm Lena Kautsky, and you have already had some presentations from my husband and brother-in-law. So we are this Kautsky family that do a lot of studies here at the Stockholm University. And I, I will talk ab uh, something about uh, adaptation in benthic vegetation of different kinds. And also I try to give you a short uh, view on, on how to use benthic algae and, and root and macrophytes as indicators in different perspectives. So just a general background on, on what the presentation <coughs> will include. Um, as I said, something on adaptation to life in the Baltic Sea. Uh, I would take up some examples of measuring stress responses uh, using macroalgae as indicators for this ecological status classification that we do within the Water Framework Directive, and also uh, something on introduced uh, species very shortly and their ecological effect on ecological status and ecosystem functioning. So uh, w we will deal with three words, um, effects on, on factors on different time scales. And I think it's very important to think about uh, acclimation Whenever we do an experiment, we, we need to acclimatize our organism before we do the experiment to have them at least a little bit adapted to, to what, whatever we are exposing them to, maybe growing them in a common garden f for some time. Quite short, I mean, usually it's for short-lived organisms, it would be a, a, a day or, or two, and for the longer ones, it would be one or two weeks. Uh, adaptations will then uh, deal with timescales which are much longer and that is really important to, uh, to think about the life cycle and, and how long lives the organism that we are studying. Um, could it have really been adapted? And we talk about a little bit more about that. And then uh, the evolution. Is it really possible to develop uh, a new species within this 5,000, 7,000 years that the Baltic Sea has existed in the same kind of salinity and ice conditions? And we found one some years ago now that I will talk about. Repetition, this after the course you will know by heart outside. <laughs> uh, there are um, it's a large stable salinity gradient. The marine macroalgae species are stressed because it's too low salinity. The freshwater species are stressed because it's too high salinity. So all the organisms living in the Baltic Sea are in some way uh, stressed. And many of them live on their limit on how, f how low or how high salinity they can tolerate. And it will affect growth rate, size, reproduction, life stages, survival. And I will have several examples of this in a little while. And all of these uh, effects on, on growth rate size reproduction is, of course, very important for um, being adapted to, to this low salinity and also for species evolution. This is a paper some years ago now from Johannesson and Andre, uh, which shows. Um, the Baltic Sea here, Atlantic Ocean, and there's these lines are just general speculation on, on how an organism could react entering into the Baltic Sea. So uh, there is no genetic differentiation. You could have a slow isolation by distance so that you get less and less genetic variability. Uh, it could be some specific factor that really disturbs the species and, and it drops quite strongly. Or we can have a, a genetic shift, which is very distinct in, in between. And this would be in the Sund area, where we had this large drop in salinity. And they also investigated a number of uh, species. And I, I took away the animals, because we are only talking about <laughs> plants now. But you can see from these curves that some of them, for instance, this red algae ceramium has a rather steep, continuous decrease in genetic uh, diversity getting into the Baltic Sea. Or there is, for Sostra marina, there is a quite 
strong drop, this is the place where, where it enters in the horizon area. And most or all of these examples, the ves Physicus vesiculosus, serratus, cladophora, all of them lose genetic diversity entering into the Baltic Sea. And the more species we study, the more we see the same pattern that the species uh, at outside the Baltic Sea has a higher genetic diversity than inside. And of course, this has quite a possible impact on uh, having a new species evolve or having adaptations to a no new low salinity life. Um, the first example I will take is from um, rooted aquatic plants. Um, I don't know if you think about it, but uh, they evolved many millions of years ago on, on land, and then they have re-entered into the aquatic environment. And on land you have to have a good tissue for transporting uh, water and nutrients up to the leaf and the flowers, and you have to be uh, strong in the structure to be able to be held up. But of course this is not a very good uh, attribute in, in the sea, because if you would be like a, a a straw uh, and then you would break very quickly as soon as you enter back into to the water movement. So you have to be very bendable and flexible. And um, they also take up part of the, the nutrients directly from the water. So uh, having very fine leaves uh, like this underwater leaves from this ranunculus species. These are the underwater uh, leaves while the the leaves that they keep above the, the surface, they are, are quite broad and, and different from, from the underwater leaves. Uh, it's also quite interesting, this is uh, wind or insect pollinated. They have a flower that has to, to get pollinated uh, above the surface. And then they have the root system that keeps them growing on the sediment. So they are restricted how deep they can grow. They can't grow how deep because then they will not get the flower up over the surface. There's rather few species that have been able to do this, but uh, one of the, them are, are this Ranunculus uh, Bardotzi, which we can find when we get out to Asker. And it, they have a very interesting, I think, adaptation to living in the, in the aquatic environment. After having the flower up over the surface, they bend down the stalk what it's called, shelk, mm -hmm. uh, to get the seeds dropping down into the sea. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that they really have this specific adaptation for getting the seed in the right place. Uh, you also have some many species that have floating seeds for uh, large dispersal or vegetative tubers or other parts of the, the the plant that is adapted to a, a life in the sea. And uh, we will find a lot of those that they are now preparing for the autumn to overwinter. So they have specific um, adaptations for getting back into the life in the Baltic and in the water. I just also wanted to take up some other things that we usually, I studied this some years ago in the 80s, uh, what really aquatic plants, rooted aquatic plants are doing and uh, they affect a lot of various factors um, in, in the, and this is for the sediment and uh, nutrients in the sediment. So um, during low saline, uh, high <laughs> the method toxicity. Is low when we have high salinity, high pH, and high organic content down here in the sediment. So um, the root system here is quite uh, able to change the whole microenvironment around the root hairs. They pull down from the shoot, they pull down um, oxygen to oxygenize the, the environment around the, the root hairs, and that's possible for them then to live in a more or less otherwise anoxic sediment. And by doing this, they will um, lower the pH around the root hairs. 
and that will I increase um, the redox potential and uh, oxidize the, the, the surroundings around the root hairs. And this changes the whole chemistry of, of metals in, in the sediment. And uh, we could, uh, also when going out now to ask you, we can dig up some of these root systems and look at what it really looks like in the, in the, in the, in the detail when they change the, so you find lots of uh, oxygenized iron and, and so on around and this. And doing this, they, they will also make uh, the cadmium or heavy metals available in the root system and then uh, old uh, toxic compounds that we have put out in the sediments uh, and when we get aquatic plants uh, colonizing these sediments they will be able to take up the old sins that we place there and then they can um, take them up and make them available again in the food chain. You should of course interrupt me whenever you have a question or something. Uh, another example is cordophyllum, um, English called dead man's rope. I don't know if it's really true that you could be like having this around your neck and being killed, but maybe. From the Atlantic to the Baltic, the, the one of the main differences is the, the changes in the cell structure and they have much uh, bigger uh, cells here and the, the cells get very small in the Baltic Sea and also the, the full talus get much smaller uh, and with a thinner cortex. So all these are, are differences that occur in, in, in the plants without, and part of them of course being uh, an adaptation or so to low salinity. They also change the net production of oxygen. So the Atlantic species uh, will have their optimum around 30, 35. Uh, and then it drops quite quickly when it enters into the Baltic Sea. But if you take a specimen from, from the Baltic Sea, it has an, its highest production at around this 6, 8, 10 uh, percent. So you have the structure change, the production change in, in this um, macroalgae species and you will find them in, in most of the species that have entered into the Baltic Sea. I don't know how much you have um, read about macroalgae and, and the different life cycles of them, but um, the red algae, they have very complex life cycles. And um, the sexual life cycle uh, in the Oslo Fjord in, in Norway, uh, they will be more or less 100% sexually producing and the little part of them non-sexual. Uh, they have a special type of, of spores that they produce in Kattegat and they still have some sexual reproduction. But entering into the Baltic Sea, the, you will have this vegetative fragment that is really characteristic for most of the, the red algae that they lose the sexual part of their, their whole life cycle and they just reproduce by fragments. Uh, we did an experiment and, and some of these red algae, they, they can survive at extremely low, almost freshwater conditions up in the Baltic Sea, uh, in the northern part of Bosnian Bay. Uh, and these are specific clones or types that can do this. Ceramium is one of the species that uh, researchers here in, in at Stockholm University, Britta Eklund, has developed a specific test method to use for trying toxic compounds, which is quite interesting to, to have an organism that is adapted to the Baltic Sea and you, you can use them in cultivations and then you can have them for these toxic compound studies. Uh, something about the fucus species in the Baltic. Uh, we have, we look at adaptation to salinity effect on growth rate, reproduction, tolerance to desiccation and freezing, and this new developed 
species and uh, also what a tool of genetic studies can tell us that no ecologist or, or anything else could uh, really reveal. So in the North Sea, uh, the fucus species are growing, they could be covered by ice like this. When there is low tide, you, you get ice crystals on top of them. Or they can be out in the water for half a day or more during low tide. Um, so these are, are really exposed to both desiccation and, and freezing. And if you go to the Baltic Sea, they, they live constantly below the surface, except for very low water periods in the springtime. Uh, and um, they also have to uh, cope with low light conditions. And we have a phenomenon uh, in the Baltic Sea that is called submergence. submergence. Uh, so in the if we go for the west coast species first, Fucus erratus, it grows just above, more or less, in the intertidal. And the same with vesiculosis. And then when you enter in to Skagerrak and into Kalmar Sund and so on, you will find them a, a little bit, half a meter or so, below the surface. Fucus erratus is the one that goes deeper. And this uh, submergence pattern has been explained that there are no other large brown algae that are growing at those depths in, in the Baltic Sea. On the Swedish west coast and the Atlantic coast, you would have all the kelp species and other species that would occupy this environment. So this would be free space for these brown algae to, to grow. The light is enough for them. And in the upper part, we have this Fucus radicans, which we come back to the new species that we described some years ago. So um, we can see at some differences in salinity and growth rate. Um, if we look at vesiculosis, the most common species in the Baltic Sea, in the North Sea, it has uh, quite a large uh, length growth per, per month and uh, not so many, eight, nine shoots coming out from each, uh, each hole fast. They grow less uh, yes. centimeters per, per month, for four months uh, in the Baltic Sea and they have more of these fronds coming out from the hold fast and the plants in the Baltic Sea also get quite old. Uh, I made some studies on them and put out some cable tiles around them and uh, follow this for many years and have a rough estimate that um, a Fucus vesiculosus plants can get about 30, 40 years old as an individual. And of course that's rather old uh, compared to the Swedish West Coast where they're living in this intertidal area where they will be for maybe three, four, five years. But being below the surface and nothing is really killing them, then they can regrow fronds from the same hole fast. It's also uh, possible to um, uh, cut off more or less the whole frond and just leave a little piece of a hole fast and that will regrow again and get the same individual. There is one estimate from Ascophyllum on the Swedish west coast determining it to be about 80 to 90 years. So it's similar to the, the old trees uh, on land. The receptacles, um, they also reproduce more on the Swedish west coast. This is from the Tjerni laboratory uh, close to Strömstad. About double uh, amount of reproductive effort, coming out more receptacles mm. and more gametes, of course, also. And uh, it depends on that the Baltic Sea has fewer of these reproductive shoots <coughs> is the main reason for it. So there are 
uh, differences between uh, the, the Fucus that you, that's the grosses that you find on the Swedish west coast or Atlantic coast and the ones that you find in the Baltic Sea. Then we did uh, an experiment, um, a transplantation experiments where we uh, seeded Fucus vesiglosus uh, from the Baltic Sea and from the North Sea on, on little plates and then we transplanted them to the different sites from Asker to over to China uh, with the aim to test about this if they have adapted to this subtidal life and low uh, salinity. And the results, uh, this was transplanted for one and a half year. They grow very slowly, so it, uh, they were, after one and a half year, they are about four, four or five centimeters. So here we have um, the rather narrow plants from the Swedish North Sea, transplanted uh, and grown in the Baltic Sea. They get even more narrow. Uh, the native Baltic Sea, they are compared to those quite wide and um, looking at uh, these plants for so many years that I have been doing it, uh, I can, I don't think that you could cheat me on an on a <laughs> adult plant at least. Germlings, I, I'm not so sure, maybe. So, but also these are, when transplanting, they get smaller, so they, they, they have um, at least lost some uh, of their adaption, and um, uh, also if maybe they have lost some of, of the possibility to live in this intertidal changing environment. And there is a, a, an indication of local adaptation. So we went on with um, doing these uh, transplantation experiments. Um, we had them. Um, in a beaker, then we put uh, them out, um, and part of them either we uh, we did an, a desiccation experiment where we dry them for one hour, two hours, three hours, or we put them into a freezer uh, at minus 15 cent centigrade for one hour and, and two hours and so on. And then we put them back into to water again to see if they could cope with this kind of intertidal uh, stress. To do these measurements, uh, uh, we used the uh, fluorescence meter. I don't know if you have seen one of those. Anyone? Yes? And I, I couldn't resist this because if you go to the web, you will find that uh, this fluorescence, when, when you, you give a signal uh, to uh, you, you uh, put dark adapted uh, uh, cells into uh, a light pulse, then they give a fluorescence pulse. Uh, and uh, this uh, fluorescence from, from the chlorophyll uh, was observed by uh, Hans Kautsky, uh, not the Hans Kautsky here, but his uh, grandfather's, my husband's grandfather's brother. And he saw it with his bare eye. I thought it is very quite interesting. You have this noctiluca, one of these plant um, phytoplanktons that give this bright light, uh, which is also flore fluorescence. And um, so he invented the, the this method to measure fluorescence, and it's called the Kautsky effect. I like. So what we did, we put um, this. Um, plants. We have the control plants up here, and then uh, we let them desiccate. Um, and here they are. are, are we get get the effective fluorescence yield with this, this ratio, and we desiccated them at 25 centigrade. And the interesting part is really that these are the are the Baltic plants. It takes quite a while until they have lost all the water and, and are, are more or less getting a constant, very low effective photosynthetic yield. While this curve, you can see it drops quite much quicker. 
and then it gets constant. And the recovery curve after one hour desiccation, the this only the one hour that recover. The other ones from the Baltic Sea, two and three hours, they will not recover. While from the, the North Sea plants, they, the one hour recovers more or less immediately as you put it back in, into the water. And the other ones will recover in one day or two. So um, the capacity to, to lose water is very important for the algae. If you lose water quickly, then the cell structure will not be destroyed. So, and th that is an adaptation that the plants in the Baltic Sea living subtidal all the, those 5,000, 6,000 year, they have lost. So they can, cannot really lose water very quickly. And then the cell structure is lost and, and they cannot tolerate to live in this intertidal, sometimes being uh, dried out and sometimes being under the water. And similar uh, with um, freezing adult tissue, uh, the Baltic plants uh, didn't survive very well uh, the, the desiccation, uh, the freezing at minus 15. They survive at plus 5 and they survive minus 7. And young plants uh, also, those uh, young plants from uh, the Baltic Sea will, will have problems with, with being frozen for, for a longer period. So there are this change that has occurred uh, within them that cannot be, because these were the, the plants that had been uh, adapted and grown for one and a half year in the same condition. They were seeded at, at this salinity. So they really had been adapted as much as possible. Um, this is a, a rather complicated curve. Um, the only thing I, I really want you to look at is that these two up from the northern part, uh, these squares, uh, is from Jernes, which is this Fucus radicans and this other white one is Fucus vesiculosus from the Dusk area. The other ones are, are marine sites. Uh, and th these are the sperm, their velocity paths. So we, we took little um, glasses where we released the gametes and the sperms from, from Fucus vesiculosus. And then we looked at how they are swimming and uh, how motile uh, the sperms are, and also here the white points are, are mobile at the lower salinity and they have a high, higher velocity and higher path rate at um, uh, low salinity than the marine species. And it's quite interesting because to do these experiments we had to film them. So we have for this, uh, um, I think we have 24 hours of swim sperming <laughs> or sperm swimming, <laughs> uh, running around with, with little glass slides and measuring uh, over and over again. So if you have a boring night, you can have <laughs> a sperm swimming film. <laughs> How big are they? They are about one, two micron. Me. So they are very small. Uh, it another important factor, of course, if, if you are in an intertidal environment, it's very important to attach very quickly to the hard substrate. So cell formation and uh, attachment is very important after. So this is the time after adding sperms. So you have Fucus vesiculosus in the marine environment. It takes for 90 percent a few minutes, uh, five to ten minutes. In the Baltic Sea, it takes about half an hour. And for uh, radicans, we haven't found it in the marine environment yet. Maybe it's up in the White Sea. Uh, 
it takes about um, 30, uh, 50 percent, takes about 200 minutes. So it, it's very, very slow. And of course, if, if you need to attach to a surface and the waves are coming all the time, it's, it's really important to have a quick attachment. Uh, and again, it's the, the low salinity that inhibits this process. Uh, Fucus radicans I have mentioned a number of times now. It occurs from here in Örgrund up to about Umeå and then it's also found on the patch around Vasa in Finland and some individuals we have found around Saruma in, in, in Estonia. It occurs together with vesiculosis and I was ready to describe it as a new species many years ago in Örgrund area because I found these two plants that were very different growing next to each other and to have that in an environment, the same environment, I thought it was really two different species. Uh, but there are many variants, uh, large variants in, in the Ficus vesiculosus in the Baltic, so I, I didn't dare, depending on, on my other marine colleagues. And um, uh, then we, we looked a bit on, on uh, well, the main reproductive period uh, for Fusicus vesiculosus is in May, June. Uh, for Radicans is later on in July, August. These are f growing faster per season. This is a, a very slow growth phase. They have very small receptacles, about five millimeters, and never have any floating bladders. So maybe it doesn't occur in the southern part and in, in the Baltic Sea uh, because it's outcompeted by Fucus vesiculosus, uh, which grows much bigger and, and uh, higher. And then we also looked at um, the proportion of female and males. So I if we look at Fucus vesiculosus, which are these four, uh, the uh, sea. They have about 50-50 male and female plants, which is the normal thing for for algae or others with two sexes to have the same 50-50 in, in the populations. But looking at some of the, the populations uh, in Örgrund and in the North Sea of Fucus radicans, um, we found a very skewed uh, sex ratio and we couldn't really explain it until we got uh, the genetic analysis and we were able to show that um, the Fucus vesiculosus, they more or less all of them are genetically uh, unique individuals, while um, there are very few genetic unique individuals in Fucus radicans. They only, most of them are, are clones. So this is one big clone and we looking at the pat pattern along the coast we could we found that up in Umeå and on the Swedish coast here all these that are blow, blue in the circle they are about the main 70% or more of the population is the same female clone so it's one female clone that is growing attached plants from here all the way up uh, to Umeå. So it's one of the largest individual that occurs in the Baltic Sea. And of course if you speculate if something would happen to that genetic individual it would get a disease or so, it would kill the whole population, 70% of, of Fucus radicans. Um, on just as a curiosity, this green one and the orange one here uh, are two male uh, clones on the Finnish side. So maybe sometimes there can be a, a, with the currents that could come uh, drifting over one or two uh, male plants and then we can have a new sexual reproduction on, in, in the area. But then we were under, of course, a lot about how, how they uh, would do this. And we did an experiment showing that um, 
if you take these little fragments that uh, you find on, on the Ficus radicans and you uh, cut them and put them on little plates and leave them calm for about six, seven weeks, then they will uh, reattach. Uh, so this is a, an attached fragment with little rhizoids in, in the bases. And these are the rhizoids that Fucus species use uh, to attach. Well, if you do that on most of the ve Fucus vesiculosus, they will just grow new little tips, which will make them free-floating individuals. And uh, so for, for the first time we have this uh, unique uh, species so far, we haven't found it outside the Baltic Sea. Uh, the genetic people uh, uh, that we are working with think that has it has evolved in the Baltic Sea <coughs> over the last two, three thousand years uh, from uh, vesiclosis, so it's very closely related to vesiclosis. And it has this unique uh, life cycle that it, from little fragments, can produce new uh, individuals or, or of course they are, are clones. They also have the sexual reproduction but then they need a f male individual coming from maybe from Finland. And um, this uh, attribute to, to b having fragments attached needs really to have calm conditions for a long time. And that will occur during winter time up in the Bosnian Sea where the ice is covering uh, the area for uh, many months and it's totally calm. So that would not be a, a, any useful way of, of dispersal for an intertidal uh, macroalgae. And the low salinity uh, that will increase polyspermia that you get several sperms entering the same egg. And you have this sec skewed sex ratio which also reduces the, the amount of possible sexual reproduction. And now it's time for a break. Then we go on with my very much loved ask Fucus. Um, so uh, some uh, more about the Fucus reproduction. Uh, I've told you about uh, that you have female and male plants and uh, the female plants will have eight eggs per agonia, uh, which will be inside these receptacles. If you cut them open, uh, you will see these egg, uh, eight eggs, and then they will break up into the open water. And the same from the male plant. In little hollows, you will find these branches with 64 uh, sperms per package, which go out into the open sea, and they break up, and then they fertilize the egg, uh, egg gets down and we talked about that it's important that it attaches very quickly to the hard substrate and then it produces a germling and then it gets either male or a female again. This, um, sorry, uh, the egg and, and sp sperm and gametes mature during full moon and new moon. Um, so they, these are the main reproductive time of Fucus vesiculosus and since uh, we found out that they, they have this moon cycle of, of uh, reproduction which is very common in intertidal species, uh, you find them in, in many uh, intertidal species in the, in the Atlantic and there is one of these polychaetes in Hawaii which swarms once a year in full moon. So that's very uh, common, but the interesting thing is that the vesiculosis in the Baltic Sea has kept this lunar cycle, although it has been below the surface all the time, because triggering it in the intertidal uh, coast is that during full moon, the water goes back, it is on the shoreline, it's dried out, which is a good trigger for it, that the water comes back, it's close to the surface and it can attach very quickly. But in the, in the Baltic Sea, you still have this moonlight cycle, uh, which made a horrible problem for one of my PhD students many years ago, because she wanted to use 
eggs and sperms for testing toxic substances uh, like boat paints and so on on uh, fucus vesiculosus and sometimes she got a lot and sometimes she didn't get anything and uh, then she found out just by accident putting a calendar next to it that you had this lunar cycle uh, then it um, Uh, we found out this in the, in the lab and then of course uh, as a scientist you always have to check is it just something that occurs in the laboratory or is it something that occurs in the field. So we went out into the field and all these little white dots, I don't know if you can see them, are um, where we put out plates below female plants to catch eggs uh, during a uh, lunar cycle uh, for several weeks. And we got a full moon night, we got uh, lots of eggs in the lab and we went out at around 8, 10 in the evening to collect these plates and we didn't find anything. So we were very disappointed. And then we realized that it doesn't always look like this in the bay, it sometimes looks like this in the bay. It's quite wavy. And I, I saw the recruitment of Fucus vesiculosus that occurs maybe two or three times successfully in the Baltic Sea just disappearing that with a storm they will uh, all disappear out into the sea and there will be no, no new recruitment. Uh, if we look very carefully it's, it's uh, about 6-7 in the morning there will be a little peak every day and in the afternoon around 7-8 there will be a larger peak. So this will be going on like this every day and then on the full moon night this will be a huge uh, peak. But uh, as I said we didn't find anything in the field. So we were thinking about what really happens in the field when it's calm in the water. Uh, around the Fucus talus um, there are large changes uh, when it's still and calm. So um, the production increases pH, so if we go out and measure pH inside the Fucus belt uh, during daytime, in the evening of the sunny day and calm day it will be ab up to 10, 10.5, close to 11. It takes up all the carbon dioxide, so there is no carbon dioxide and oxygen is released. Um, and all these are signals that the water is calm. So if we take little receptacles of the vesiculosus and, and put them in a beaker, we have some of them just calm and then we put some in, in, in a beaker and put them in the shaking. And the ones that we shake didn't release. And we could also make the experiment and change the environment in, in the water. So if we took away um, the carbon dioxide and increased the pH um, and, and or inhibited photosynthesis, then they didn't release even if we, we, they were calm. So this daily cycle we have managed to, to understand how it works, that they know uh, that it's calm in the water and then they can release. So if it's full moon night and it's wavy, they don't release, they wait one or two nights further and then they to the big release. The moonlight cycle or tidal cycle that I still have, uh, we haven't found out what it depends on. I once wanted to go with one of these space shuttles <laughs> to, to bring my Fucus vesiculosus receptacles up into the space to see if we could make something on gravity, gravitation, which would be the other idea of trying to figure out uh, what really triggers them, but I didn't get any good response from <laughs> from the guys. <laughs> <laughs> this was um, a quite important result for for uh, how to treat with um, fucus vesiculosus uh, and uh, boat paints. So we have the main re reproduction period here in in late May June depending on the moonlight cycle. And this is the time wi wi within this little bay or marina where they ha had the highest amount of copper uh, with the new painted boats putting put them out into the sea. While um, 
the barnacles uh, didn't arrive until late July, August, which are the the ones that we really want to um, inhibit. And um, so this is the life cycle of the, the barnacles. You have the nauplius larvae, then you have the suprinid larvae that attaches to, to the substrate and then changes to the full grown barnacle. So we now uh, also have this test out at the Aska laboratory where we put out plates. Um, it's a barnacle project run by Schagur Stiftelsen, the Archipelago Foundation. Uh, and we hang them out by the boathouse and then we can uh, check whenever there are the tiny little barnacles and then there is a report from all the Swedish coastline now. Um, now it's time to do something, clean your boat, uh, brush them off or, or go into a freshwater area. And we can have a look when we get out if this that uh, we was scraped out some months ago now, one month, uh, has some new barnacles because we have a very short period when our barnacle arrives. So it's easier here than on the Swedish west coast. Yes. How long time would you have to spend in uh, freshwater? A few okay. days, one, two days. They're killed almost immediately because they have such a thin shell yeah. at the moment. But are you have yes. Are the boat owners uh, quite responsive? responsive yes. To doing this? It's uh, it's also getting more and more of this driving boat uh, washing where where you can. There's one in Trusa, um, and they're building up more of of them. Uh, there are, of course, boat owners that still paint with stuff that you shouldn't mm -hmm. <laughs> use. But is this for the Barnacle SMS alert? Or yes. Okay. And you can get a, an app where, where you are told that now it has arrived in this area. And uh, It was quite interesting because before we did this with, uh, with the Focus Vesiclosis recruitment and there was no one who had ever studied when barnacles arrive and attach uh, to hard substrates in the Baltic Sea. There was a general idea that was sometimes, uh, sometimes after midsummer. And it's a totally different perspective that you have on a toxic or problematic species than what you would have on land. You just, in, in the marine environment or aquatic environment, you just use some toxic paint and you are out of you don't have any more trouble as a boat owner. Uh, we also have been using recruitment as an indicator. Uh, outside pulp mill industries, uh, we had um, quite a large kill off of Fucus vesiculosus in uh, uh, the 70s and 80s when we chlorinated uh, paper and chlorate kills the adult Fucus tully. Uh, so then the, they changed the, the industry process and we tested with this gurmling uh, uh, combination on if, if it was a clean, good water for uh, Fucus to grow in and uh, there was no uh, negative effect found by the outlet from the industry. So then we did a transplantation experiment where we transplanted uh, it was a fantastic d designed experiment where we had female and male plants within two meter distance from each other so that it would really be a good recruitment of moved stones with focus from a nearby area. And it took about a few weeks and then this little yeah, idotea had uh, more or less consumed the, the plants. You can see that there is not much of the front left, it's just small pieces up here. And they, uh, they were really heavily grazed. Uh, the m this was done outside Mönster Ås uh, in Kalmar Sund. Uh, and um, at that time, there was also indication that uh, the pike and the perch, uh, a mountain pike and perch was not good anymore. There were very few. So there were little fish around in the area and our idea was that there were two little fish 
which meant that there were really a lot of this idotea. And when we transplanted the fucus inside the area where there were lots of this idotea, they were really starving. So we, we gave them the perfect food. Uh, but then we discovered um, something interesting that earlier I said that fucus vesiculosus reproduces in May, June. But now we found a different kind of reproductive time. Um, so we have the general summer reproducing plants which have their branches with receptacles and then they produce new branches and then the next winter they will uh, start uh, the, the new uh, receptacles and then they will mature in the summer. While the autumn reproducing plants that we will also probably see out now at Daske, they produce the floating bladders in May and then they grow a little bit and then they produce the receptacles on top of the floating bladders. So this is a totally different form and time of reproduction. And we uh, now think that we have um, these two forms. They probably have always been there. You can also find them, uh, them on the Swedish west coast. Uh, but we have uh, an idea or hypothesis that this one, the autumn reproducing, will be dispersing more in the Baltic Sea because now during autumn we have very little filamentous algae on the surface. So the germlings will have easier to attach to the bottom in this more nutrient and rich environment of the Baltic Sea. So we, we can also use fucus for transplantation in another way. So we transplanted a lot of fucus to different sites. This map is not so good. Uh, Viet is close to the, here is Trusa. This is, as I understood, the place where you would take the boat. <laughs> and then we, you pass the outlet and then it gets further out all the way to Aske. So we took plants from the Aske area on similar stone size. And then we transplanted them into this gradient. And after a summer, we collected them. And the ones close to the out sewage outlet, they, they were really covered with this uh, Electra abruzzone. Uh, and then we had a gradient with the fastest and largest growing individuals a bit away from the outlet. And in the Ask area, they were quite small and, and clean and fresh uh, looking. So this kind of transplantation experiments and testing the, the quality of, of the environment has been done for areas like Trusa and, and you can also do it for testing uptake of heavy metals because they are very good in taking up heavy metals. So we can use them in different ways as, as uh, indicators. Um, uh, the macrophytes, uh, specifically, the, they should be common, uh, large, long-lived. Uh, the habitat-forming individuals uh, is good with rather high productivity. Uh, Fucus vesiculosus, other macrophytes, they, they also include a lot of high biodiversity, lots of other species. Um, they could work as nutrient carbon storing recycling indicators. And they also uh, improve the water quality by just being there, growing there, and they attach a lot of sedimentation, increase the sedimentation. And uh, others are, are more sensitive to different uh, human pressures, like too much nutrients, physical disturbance, uh, too much sedimentation, uh, or toxic compounds. Uh, what we really demand of a good indicator, of course, is that it should be highly ecological relevance. And as I have shown you, we can have some of these functions from uh, a species like Fucus vesiculosus or up in the Bosnian Sea, Fucus radicans. Um, response to, to pressures, um, this easy to interpret. I mean, we, we should try to find those that uh, we know if this disappears, then it depends on this factor. But just by showing you this example 
of transplanting into the pulp mill industry, we thought that it was clean. So there was no toxic effect anymore. But we had already changed the environment so that there were no perch eating the idotea. So uh, it's of course not easy to, to interpret the, the indicators. Uh, it should, mostly this species should have a quite wide uh, area to, to occur on and you always wish it to be easy to apply and cost effective. The idea that people now have been working with is um, to put them into different ecological status groups. The SG1 uh, are rather thick, uh, leathery. This could be a Ficus vesiculosus. Um, some of, of, of them are also these on the Swedish west coast. We will have um, calcareous algae, crustose algae, um, while the uh, other one would be more uh, ulva entromorpha like, ectocarpus, uh, filamentous or folius. Uh, and coarsely blanched or upright uh, talus. So we, th there is a project now called Waters that is working quite strongly with trying to develop these indicators further and finding this quality of the different species. <coughs> yes. Yes. G1. Uh, that is the indicator group for what status? The this will come here. <laughs> so what we. Um, the one is is the one that we <laughs> we we want the the one that is long lived and and is uh, perceived as a good quality of of the environment um, with high high light availability and uh, clear water and uh, indicator of those and the other ones with very filamentous algae are fast growing uh, and are the ones that are nutrient uh, favored by high nutrient in, in the water. So if we put these two different types in, in into some group of classes, th we would get in the reference good conditions. We would have a dominance of these rather large kelp forming or fucus communities, slow growing. This means Stenotius is um, uh, when you have a very narrow type of habitat or you occur in a very restricted type of uh, late successions, also you are late in, in, in the succession, not early in the succession. Uh, and here you have the nutrient increase um, and decreasing light availability with um, the low and bad uh, with dominance of fast-growing opportunistic seaweeds and, or, and also cyanobacteria. I will give you a, a PDF of this later on, if that. So um, there are different ways now. Uh, in Sweden, we have uh, used uh, as uh, the criteria just the depth distribution, how, how and we have selected a number of species and how deep they are able to grow in different waters. Uh, but now the, there are lots of tries to to find out this uh, grouping of of macrophytes in different groups. The the ones uh, that consist of these long-lived macrophytes, more common in undisturbed habitats, and the ones that are short-lived op opportunistic and then trying to put them into uh, how m high in how high amount they occur. So if you have uh, a very, uh, so you, you put this uh, ratio between the cover of one and the cover of two I into the total um, cover and get a, a lot of different uh, patterns. Uh, we also have divided our Swedish waters into 23 water body types. Uh, 
so from the Swedish west coast all around up here. Sweden has one of the longest coasts which uh, with this long sal lo large salinity gradient which means that we have all the different species occurring naturally so we we have uh, tried to uh, identify indicators special for each of, of, of these um, regions. Some of them, of course, on the Swedish west coast can be the same if the salinity is similar. So the species composition uh, differs. Uh, we have to try to find reference conditions. What was it looked like once upon a time before all the nutrients and before all the pollution? Uh, there are very few old data available. I think Hans Kautsky yesterday talked a bit about one of the few uh, study sites in, in Gräsö with Mats Wern. Uh, so it's a lot of expert judgment. We, somebody just says that this is probably what it should look like when it's a nice clean habitat. This uh, Hans showed yesterday, I think, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so we said that we had these 21, uh, 23 type areas along the coast here, and then uh, this is a summary of what we find I in the different areas. So these projects are, are now trying to collect as much information as possible to do this work with, the, uh, with developing in further indicators. And it, it will be tricky. <laughs> now I think Jukke should talk. <laughs> Is there much uh, written in kind of uh, journals or kind of from less technical data for historic reference conditions? Like, I don't know, notes from the <laughs> I'm from a younger part of the world, so we yes. don't necessarily have the people who have been here for so long. No, not really. Um, that, of course, there are some old uh, notes of people traveling, like Linnaeus traveled, or. Uh, but usually, what's done is that you go to some area that is not polluted today and then you, you say that this this is similar to what you would uh, strive for. Uh, I just wanted to show this. Um, uh, we, we also along the coast have uh, land uplift. Um, after the ice the land was pressed down and now the land is slowly rising. So we have in all the shallow bays a slow succession, natural, natural succession that changes with time, that has nothing to do with, with human activities. Uh, and then on top of that, of course, we can have marinas and uh, other physical disturbance or nutrient enrichment with sewage coming out into the coastal area. And we also have some newly introduced um, species. But this makes the development of this generalized indicator idea that the Water Framework Directive uh, wants us to develop extremely complicated because it's more or less each little bay that should have a special treatment or thought. And we have many. And of course it's um, in each, each of them they, there is also this uh, large amounts of, of associated I invertebrates and uh, also some uh, newcomers like Putomopyrgus and Dresenia the, that has occurred now in, in our waters. So um, I will end with um, just a few thoughts about um, newly introduced alien species and, and their effects. Um, we talked about earlier, uh, that's a wrong spelling, 
um, Bolanus, um, which is attached to both houses uh, and really has a large economic impact. Um, we um, that maybe we are now developing some techniques to cope with with not using the the toxic compounds. Um, Cercopagus um, is uh, impacting the fishery and, and possibly fish recruits by eating them. Dresena is clogging, um, I, I really expert in spelling here, gogging, gogging cooling uh, water systems. Uh, this is quite a problem for many of, of, of the, the industries with large uh, cooling systems. Marisaleria spelled right. <laughs> Looking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Affecting uh, the phosphorus circulation in, in the bottoms, uh, maybe several species. And Neogobus probably is changing the, the food web. So we have some of them that we are now starting to discuss uh, if they are giving positive effects or just being there. Uh, I'm on an early slide I mentioned this tiny little snail, Putamopyrgus, has been there for a long time. Lots of them, nobody bothers, nobody even thinks about them. Uh, Balanus, mo most people uh, uh, will be really bothered about uh, the problem with them on the boat hull. Uh, Neogobus, we are waiting for it to arrive to Swedish coast. So, so there are lots of these newcomers, uh, and in, in the Water Framework Directive, they um, decided that um, they should have been here 100 years, then we can count them as uh, native. Um, and I think this one is getting close to <laughs> Uh, there are others that uh, the big uh, Mia um, Arenaria uh, that came with Vikings, so that's now native and nobody thinks about it as something special. But uh, this is also a problem because in the Wartic fra Framework Directive, uh, if we have any introduced species, the quality of, of the environment can never be high or not even good. Uh, but we can't do anything about them, except for having ballast restrictions and so on, so that they don't get into the sea. But, but otherwise, when they are here, there's nothing else to do. So I think that maybe in the future they will have to rethink a bit about uh, the introduction of, of, of species and the classification. And my argument for that is that we also, I know that you talked about the climate change scenario yesterday. Um, and y you can have lots of, of thoughts about if this is true, that the salinity will really be so low down here. But in, in any case, if we have this blue muscle and the uh, uh, big fuku species will disappear uh, and pro probably or maybe could be reintroduced by the one species that we already have in the lagoons in the southern part of the Baltic Sea, uh, which have the Dracaena, the Balanus doing the filtering function. This nice uh, crab uh, from China, which tastes quite good, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, some other uh, introduced species. So we could maybe have a functional system, but with all these newcomers that will save the Baltic Sea to be a functional ecosystem. Um, just an idea. And that's well, for me, um, I would really like you to follow us on our Swed Baltic Seaweed blog, or Tongbloggen, where you can get any information that you want on, on Fucus and other stuff. And of course, lots of information on 
www.howard.nu. And if you have questions now or later, and during the course of course, uh, please feel always free to ask me. Thank you.